Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today is someone that's extraordinary. Look, I know you think I say that every week, and I do because I'm blessed with the uh, amazing artists that I know. But I met him a couple of years ago, and we'll get, get on to that a little bit later. But he is a photographer, a set and filmmaker. His exhibitions are extraordinary. They're out of this world. They're beyond a normal exhibition because, well, oh no, we'll get to it a little bit later. He's exhibited, along with his um, uh, partner in crime, and we'll talk about him a little bit later, around the world, and and you're know, like, and back here in Melbourne is his home, and wow, it's incredible stuff. So let's start talking to Jared O'Connor. Hello, Jared. Hello, David. Now, That's a great introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Well, you know that I love your work. Yeah, thank you. Um, and who, who is your partner that you do a lot of work with? I work, I've worked with Mark Wozniak for 25 years, making artworks together. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you're the photographer That's and right. filmmaker, and he yeah. is... He's wardrobe. He's, he's really a stylist, wardrobe and prop person. How, how did you meet each other? So we met... Um, I, I studied photography and graduated in 92 and then I started working in nightclubs and um, just to, while I was um, pursuing a career as, actually as a fashion and commercial photographer. And so I worked at Razor initially and then I got a job working on the door of Tasty, uh -huh. which was a gay nightclub in Melbourne. And I met Mark on the door of Tasty and that was in the early 90s. And I'd established a bit of a career as a commercial photographer doing more interesting kind of photography. So I, was, I had clients like Telstra and Hard Yakka. And even then I was making surreal kind of imagery. And, um, and Mark was really stylish when I, when I first met him. And I thought, oh, I need someone to handle my wardrobe and my props and my, and I suggested styling. And he said, oh, that's a, a, a bit of an upcoming career. And so we started doing editorial together and meeting people we found interesting and then doing um, imagery that was for our folios to get extra work. Yeah. And then um, we quickly started being invited to exhibit in um, joint shows, uh, group shows actually in the early 90s or early to mid 90s. Right. And um, yeah, and then we got some big clients, worked commercially together, did editorials for all the fashion magazines and, and um, then we got a bit frustrated, I think, by the commercial world and thought we could make it bigger and better. Yep. And um, then we started doing the artworks together after right. that. So, Jared, the one thing that I've got to ask, you know, where does the inspiration come from? Because you've done, the, well, the one that I, I discovered you guys was Queen, Queens of the Pub, yep. uh, which was about, oh, you explain. So basically what we, when, when we started making works together, we, we start looking at a bit of history and then we, a bit of fantasy as well. Yep. So we'll always, research something that's actually happened or a person that's inspiring uh -huh. and that particular exhibition queens of the pub was an ode to the history of st kilda and when i there was a woman actually when i first moved out of home called maria who ran the evelyn hotel in brunswick street and she was an old italian woman and you if you didn't have money you'd go there on like when before you got your um your, your doll and she would like let you come back the next day and pay for your meal or your cigarettes. And I always remembered she was, she would sit at the bar and she would hold court and she would deal with, you know, bands and people in the hotel. Yeah. And she was like a queen, yeah. really. It was like yeah. visiting royalty. And then when I moved to St Kilda, I realised a lot of women ran all these hotels, including the Esplanade Hotel, including the Seaview Ballroom. I did all this research. And a lot of the women that ran the hotels were European women. And in the 70s, when these inner city hotels went into disrepair, they looked for ways of surviving. So they had Monday night was a gay night. Then they'd have punk nights that have, um, you know, like... Um, alternative nights, they would cover all sorts of different, whilst having borders upstairs, whilst doing meals. So they were quite amazing kind of people. Um, and we thought, let's do a complete ode to St Kilda by collecting the materials left over from conversations from hotels, which was bottle tops and refuse. So we got it from the Vineyard and from the Esplanade Hotel and from the George and all the iconic hotels. And over two years made um, royal armour and royal attire, like capes and crowns and tiaras and dresses. And we sat there together like in a sheltered workshop, like drilling um, 
bottle tops and then we, I, I found a jeweller who could help us assemble, she's like a costume jeweller who could help us assemble these things and yeah we made the whole wardrobe out of recycled rubbish from St Kilda wow. basically. Wow and there's one shot in particular and I, I can see it over your shoulder it is a cape. It's a spectacular yeah. gold cape. Yeah. And what it is, you've beaten bottle tops flat That's right. and then you screwed a little hole in the top and bottom yeah. and it's, it's, a, it's a link chain. It's like chain mail. So yep. we would literally put four holes in, we'd flatten each bottle top, put four holes in and link them together one by one. Whoa. So, I mean, I got a lot of friends involved on a Thursday and we would sit there like a sheltered workshop and have a few drinks and then put <laughs> this cape together. And also, it's, it's kind of amazing how um, committed you get people when you've got a, a, a concept or something that they believe in. And yep. because it was all about recycling yep. and the history of St Kilda, yeah, we did get a bit of support in putting the, the yeah. costumes together. And, and that is a spectacular cape, isn't yeah. it? You yeah. know, where, where is it now? You it's, know? it's folded up, actually, under the... Um, Mark's got a big prop room under his... Um, he's got an old... Uh, block of flats in Pran and he's got heaps of props and we've folded it right. all up. Okay. Because it always moment. needs to be on display. Yeah, well, that's when, jo generally when we've had our exhibitions, we, we film, we used to film the making of the work and now we film a little story about the work. So we did a punk ode to Vivian Westwood with this cape. Um, but then when we had that exhibition that you came to, we had the costumes on display yeah, as well. Yeah. And we also had the ladies in waiting were wearing um, these big dresses which were made of old men's suits and jackets and um, they were they're all recycled as well. So yeah. I like that. And then, then we have characters from the pictures at the exhibitions as well. I yeah. like the whole thing to be you know, in interactive. How many people um, were in shot? There's one uh, one photo, the main photo, which is on the stair at yep. uh, the SB. Yep. Spectacular shot. No, How many people are in that shot? Um, that was, we called that the coron Queen's Coronation and there's there would have been 40 people in Whoa. that shot. And there's children and adults. Because and they're little choir boys. Choir and boys, all, yeah. yeah. And, lady, and then young ladies in waiting. And then there was, because it's, it was an ode to um, the rock and roll uh, like height of, of the Esplanade where they had like bands like Nick Cave and famous people playing. We had all like Vivian Westwood and rock and roll looking characters sitting around enjoying the, their thing because we thought the punk thing also had quite a royal touch because of its connection to yep. the history of success yep. of, the, of the people that left here and, and, and went overseas. Yeah. But yeah, we had say 40 in that and then we did a shot in the Gershwin room which was the, um, the, the Queen's Court and we had probably probably 70 people in that. Whoa. Yeah. And you had to dress them all. And, and didn't a lot of them have, you made characters yeah. for them as well? Yeah, well that's, because, because we do calls, like we do a call out on social media or we will do, um, we do a Facebook page or we have lists of people we've worked with before. Yep. We actually cast them like they're a film. Yep. So we'll look for the queen, for instance, we'll look for the, you know, the, her partner, we'll look for the ladies in waiting. And when they come to the casting, we'll give them a character to go away with. So one could be a you know, drunk lady in waiting or one could be you know, a down and out person sitting at a bar. And so you give people um, things to come back, obviously. So, cause, so because it's like a film production, yeah. um, even though we're doing stills, yeah. um, it, they come with more than yep. what the, the, you do in the still. So it must be exhausting, you know, like doing that set up, you know, like, being in a venue that's going to open later in the day yeah. uh, and you must what do you do it in the middle of the night or something yeah or? well we do that in that one in particular we had over a few days and so we, we you start it like when you work in film you can start at three in the morning or four in the morning yep. and the staircase scene we had to actually be off the staircase by one o'clock so you yep. rush through that and then move somewhere else but if you work with you have to work with the venue and um make sure that they're happy with because that they're contributing to it as well. And they wanted the end result to be as authentic and an ode to the venue as, pos as, as yeah. it could possibly be. Yeah. Um, but I think the funny thing that we do is photography's become such a quick medium these days where film is about a big 
production yep. and thought out and planned, we're making stills which have got that element of production like film does. Yeah. And um, so. And, and what, what did um, SB say when, the, when they saw what you did? They must have been blown away. Oh, yeah, they, they were totally supportive of it. They loved it. They gave us access to the venue for like a week. So yep. we stored stuff upstairs. And, yep. you know, they're used to having the, the iconic Gershwin room yep. as they had rock quiz there and they've had lots of bands there. So the current owner, we just went and pitched the idea and he was really, really excited. And unfortunately, we were going to actually show there, but it was over lockdown. So it, that happened not bef not long before lockdown. So we were going to do a walking tour, a Queen's tour of the pub and have like Royal Meal and have oh, the different wow. pictures and then the Queen sitting at the table while you're having meals and stuff. So we thought of ways of, of making it an interactive art experience yeah. for, the, for the venue. Do you make money out of something extraordinary like that? You know, like well, it, it costs so much money to stage it all. It it does, and so I I did make money when I was doing a lot of commercial work, which I got dissatisfied by. And then I found the more that we exhibited, we will slowly sell work. And then we've won some quite big awards. So I've won some cameras and some equipment. But I've found that when you're working with creative people, if you have a genuine concept that you believe in, that is the best way to get things happening yep. outside of having money. Yep. So you'll write and try and maybe get some funding or you will um, write to companies that aren't, um, you're not doing the cliche run the mill project. Mm. So mm. people will jump at the opportunity. Mm. And I, I think it's almost probably more an American or English approach where people really see the bigger picture mm -hmm. but if you show them the what we're, like what we'll do is go and visit a venue or a place and show them what we've done historically like yep. a, a beach scene or a you know one of our war scenes or things that we've done in the past and then people people want to support people do want to support art i think yeah you know and the, and the wonderful thing is, so um, it, it, you know, it was ran here, exhibited here. Yeah. Uh, and then in lockdown, in stage four lockdown, and you couldn't even travel because you weren't allowed to leave Melbourne unless you're isolated. Uh, a gallery in Sydney yeah. staged it yeah. as, as well, the, the exhibition. Yeah, so weirdly I found a gallery, Gallery Pom Pom, which was on um, just Instagram and I just liked the name and reached out to them and they took the show to Sydney and then the, we called it the Royal Tour of Sydney and then it toured to about three galleries in Sydney and only just came back last week. Wow. And so, and then also it was part of um, Chill Out in Hepburn. So in lockdown it got a lot of, it really did travel, which yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. Now, yeah, like, let's tell um, the viewers some of the other ones. You've, you've done a tango one, which was filmed in the meat market That's uh, over in North Melbourne. Yep. Uh, and you would swear that you were in... Um, um, in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, well, that was inspired because we'd done... Previously, we'd done a big shoot, which is the Victoriana Pleasure Garden, we called it. And that was about the whole history of um, the Victorian Pleasure Gardens, which really were the first fashion event as early spring, people, which people would open their houses and invite everyone mm. into their gardens to show their finery. Mm. So we did a, a huge exhibition at Rip and Lee and um, did it with the, with the National Trusts, like gave us access to their, their place because we showed them our previous work. Yep. And um, that, and then we had um, magical creatures, which the Victorians believed in, and we had fairies and foxes and the occult, and, and we did about 30 images. So that, um, got us invited to be the only Australians to show at the Festival of Light, which was in Buenos Aires in, in South America. And when Mark and me went to Buenos Aires to show there, um, they had this big, they have like huge art openings where they had the Governor General from Australia at them. So we met Peter Cosgrove. And yeah. um, while we were showing there, we every night at nine or 10 o'clock at night, people would go out dancing tango dancing and you'd see like little old women like in their 75 walking down these like really rough streets going out to dance till three in the morning or young people and the dance floors were just swapping partners yep. of, and so they invited us to do our because we I was so blown away by the street tango not the showbiz tango um, and so they invited us to do something here um, and we were going to go back and do it there but it it made more sense to, to, to find a place here that was appropriate. And the meat market had mm. the hugest cobblestone floor that I've ever seen. You know, it's like 
eight metres wide, so it's like a big European square, an yeah. Italian square. Yeah. And um, so we talked to them about it and we set it up like a, um, a nighttime tango world where we had like, I don't know, I think it was like 90 lights and just wet all the floor so it looked like a, a dirty street. And we had old you know, meat trucks being delivered so because they used to dance in markets and we had like Pinocchio and characters from that period and did, be, did a big tango... Um, a shoot there, yeah. So we um, was more nineteen forties. That was inspired by being in Buenos Aires, yeah, yeah. and then we sent some of the works back to Buenos Aires as well. And and it was accepted well. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. great. Well, four four of the works Government House took actually from the Victoriana and one of the tangos, and then um, the Museum of Modern Art in Buenos Aires collected one of the biggest scenes from the tango exhibition. Wow. We, we literally, Mark and me just thought, oh, this is one of the most exciting galleries we've ever seen. So we went in and just asked to see the director. Yeah. And he just came down and saw us and then saw our work and collected it. It's funny when you travel overseas mm. how, I don't know if it's because you're in a different headspace, but opportunities like that just occur so easily sometimes, maybe because there was an art festival on at the time. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but well, what about here? How are you accepted in the art world here? Um, you know, like, do people embrace you? Or? Yeah, well, we... It, I, the art world is a funny... It's, the art world is its own entity in, in some ways. Mark and me do this work because we love this work. So we make these exhibitions, these experiences. Um, and then we've shown in galleries, like we showed... At, Australian Centre for Contemporary Photography, actually. That's where I first um, met Al Alistair Forster. He's like one of the big, big yep. names in art. And he, yep. he got us to um, go to a big exhibition in China, actually, seven or eight years ago. So he's he's like an intellect in in the art world. We've never really been intellectualised artists. Like, we, we just make works that we believe are... Um, exciting and approachable and people want to view mm. and that include a massive um, collaboration of other artists making work under under one one kind of vision so I don't know when it when it comes to the art world Australia's um, I mean we've got really interesting people in Tasmania doing things we've got yep. a fantastic National Gallery here yep um, but uh, they don't collect you, that you haven't exhibited there. We've never exhibited there. No, we've more... Ex and you need to walk up to the door one oh, day <laughs> with the door. a couple, you know, like, and, and say, say we're, we're not moving until you look at this. Because if they saw it in the flesh, you know, like, that you'd be one over. Because they're, they're so forward-thinking, the NGV here. Yeah. And maybe, maybe we're, too, we're so busy making work and doing things and then exhibiting um, in in shows that we don't, we tend not to go knocking on people's doors as much and, and chasing, like it's like a, a PR exercise. Like I'm good at, at talking about work and getting excited about future works, but maybe not as much that kind of level of things. But yeah, you need an agent. Yes, that's right. That's that's <laughs> true, very true. And it's not that hard, Mark. No, yeah, That's no. not all that hard between the two of you. It's not no. that hard. Okay, now look, I'm just going to step back a bit because the Victorian scene is just so spectacular. The costumes in in that, the, the, the shoot that you did there, are beautiful. Yeah. Um, did you make all of them yourself or did you hire them? Or? So that, that particularly was like months of pre-production. Of pre so some of them were from the Victorian State Opera. We got them from okay. um, Gilles from there. We got them from... Um, uh, we got them from the ABC. We got them from... Um, there's a couple of old costume makers in Sydney, um, Janine, who's a special, who collects uh, Victorian clothing. So Mark flew to Sydney and we spent two days going through her collection of Victorian clothing because uh, the issue with a lot of the old stuff is it's really small. So we had to put models in the old stuff. Okay. The new stuff tends not to be made with... Um, it's got a shinier finish yep. It's it's because they make them out of cheaper fabrics. Yep. Um, so we wanted more of the older stuff, but that... That just took so much pre-production because mm. it's not a, a an average fit for most yeah. of the clothing, um, and and beautiful, you know, like, yeah, like uh, it's just so beautiful. Some some of the shots, uh, and where did you do your the the major exhibition for that? 
So that exhibition we showed at the, we approached the City of Melbourne and the City of Melbourne gave us the conservatory in the Fitzroy Gardens. So, and they hadn't given that to anyone before. So they said, oh, you can have that for like a month. So we had that over the spring, we connected with the Spring Fashion Festival. And so they, in between them showing their winter um, flower show, they showed their spring and we hung all the pictures in between the gardens. And then we had like, like fairies and owls coming out from the undergrowth. And we had like, um, we served like, um, like lavender tea with flowers in it. And um, even though it was, it was Melbourne spring and it was like freezing cold, <laughs> thunderous night, but we had like so many people come. We had like 600 people turn up. So the city of Melbourne have been then fantastic. Like any venue I've wanted to show or exhibit, they've been totally supportive of because because yeah. of the event um, thing. So from that then we then, we showed that moved on to the National Trust and then that went to Buenos Aires yep, yep. Um, after that. But previously we'd shown in um, probably the biggest show we'd had previous to that was in China in Pingyao and we had a 35 piece exhibition there which we shipped from Melbourne to right. Buenos Aires. Again, I don't understand why you're, we didn't see it on the news you know, like that. You know, it, it is though that outstanding what you're doing and what and how you exhibit it. It's just um, we've got to talk. We've got to talk. Um, now, also, just one of the most extraordinary pieces that you, that you did, exhibitions you did, was the beach scene on St Kilda Beach in the fifties. In the fifties, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we did, that was, pro Mark and me did a series that was kind of the biggest when we thought photography, let's really push it and get as many people into a picture as possible. So, <laughs> so you've got the world record the, for the most people in one photo. In one photo. <laughs> and we researched all these illustrators, like there was one called William Hogarth, who used to draw Victorian scenes in the... Um, in the 1800s and we did four images. One was a, a, a bordello scene, which we built a set for. One was a beach scene and that was based on an American artist who did, um, so we always based things on, he did a, an image on Coney Island and I always thought Luna Park and St Kilda Beach was a real Coney Island yep. kind of looking scene. Yep. So the ideal thing about going to the beach is you're squashed amongst a whole variety of different people and yep. it's, that's your experience on a hot day yeah. and that's Australian, European, wherever you are. And so that, that um, we, we actually shot that in a studio and filled it with sand and then we did put the um, Luna Park in the background and then we had some seagulls like actually flying around the um, studio when we were doing it and children pissing on the sand and dogs and licking ice cream and yeah, just a, a slice of diversity. Yeah, and would, is it how, you know, like you, you said the, the St Kilda backdrop is um, added, but is all the people in the shot, were they all there at the one time? Yeah. So, wow. So yeah, because when we first started doing the group scenes, we could drop people in, but I always thought the better reactions you got was when people were performing together and the shadows, and even though it's, the, it's it's still it's always complicated in a bit of post production, but you have to have people together in order to get an authentic looking image because people respond differently to each other. Like there's photographers, famous people like Annie Leibovitz, who yep. will shoot. She uh, uh, she's an iconic photographer. Who she is. I've always loved. Who's put people together and made amazing iconic images. But you, she would leave the cross on the ground where Nicole Kidman would stand, oh, and okay. then you know someone else, and she puts them together, lights them beautifully. And I thought I just am not that photographer. I want people sitting on each other's faces, mm. or you want to see the explosion. Yeah, and the excitement level of it, and the yeah. creativity yeah. of making everyone do the right thing at the right time. Well, because they bring something to you that yeah. you wouldn't actually expect as well, because you can give them a character and then you put them together in mass. It's like shooting a fancy dress, particularly when we, because we theme things. Um, we give it a theme and that, it's like a fancy dress party. People would just come alive. They just do, they give you way more than what you ever anticipated yeah. in front of you. So you like screaming with laughter behind the camera half the time because it's, it's so, such an enjoyable thing yeah. to do. And 
how do you feel after it, you know, on the day of, you know, like exhausted, you yeah. feel exhausted, but how excited and exhilarated, you probably can't sleep for the next 24 hours because you'd it's, be buzzing, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's really, it's weird, it's really exhilarating. And then at some points you almost have to go away and shut the door and be on your own for a second because it's just overwhelming at some points. And it's probably that sugar where you go down in the afternoon yep, and yep. you either need a drink or some sugar or something. Yep. But just seeing that amount of people around you that you are directing is, that you feel quite responsible for because everyone's there, makeup artists, stylists, you're making decisions all day long, you're really conscious of it. And then directing um, a piece that you've only got a short period of time to work on is, yeah, it's kind of an overwhelming experience, really. Okay, okay so there's 30 or 40 people in the shot. How yep. many people are behind the camera? But behind the camera, like, there's still got to be um, 25. Whoa. Like, the Victoriana, because the costumes were so complicated, yep. we had probably 60, because Mark had to have so many dresses. Because even in the big scene, even though we... that the big We did a big nighttime party scene and there would have been... Um, say 90 extras, Mark's still dressing them in little shoes, socks, everything. You know, like it takes a long time to dress them in corsets and, and um, gloves and bags. And um, even though half of the wardrobe wasn't even seen, you know, you just see the silhou silhouette of it in the distance. Yeah. It's still putting it together. So then everything's got to go back into the boxes where it came from. So he had a team of 25 people. Right. And then I needed, I had probably eight, nine assistants. Wow. And then there's a makeup team. Yep. L yep. Lizzie turned up and she had probably, I think, she had students as well. We had probably 25 in the makeup team. So it, it became massive. And everyone's doing it as a volunteer. Wow. Because it's that thing of, because we were so excited about it, and so you go to the person that you think, like Mark's the head of wardrobe, he's excited about it. So it creates a buzz. And then because the makeup, they hadn't had a chance to do stuff like that. Mm. And she was like, I want to make a wolf. I want to make a fox. I want to make an owl. I want to, and they get, and then we got her on board when we did that gothic, we did a gothic one at La Bassa. And um, that was based on a woman who lived there for years and had artists come to her table in the 1930s. And so we made a flower dress for her and she would um, have these guys standing on the table holding candles um, as hu human candelabras. And I told Lizzie about it and Lizzie said, oh, I'm taking a week off work, I'm gonna come and make you some these golden, golden candelabra characters. So it's, yeah, people, I think creativity is the thing that leads people if that's what your chosen career is. And some people, a lot of the time, even if they're doing a creative job, um, want to do more. And some people who come to be involved in the shoot are creative but never even get a chance to have creativity in their life. Yep. So they just, they're either an extra, or can do a bit of acting and never really get enough of it. And they're happy that way. They just want to be involved yeah. in the production. I've been on a, a set of yours where I was actually the... <laughs> the subject, one of the subjects, a very small scale compared to the huge things you do. Yeah. But the one thing that stood out for me on that day was the relationship between you and Mark. Yeah. You work so well together. Yeah. Uh, not one moment of raised voices. No. Everyone just did. And there were, you know, like there was a make makeup person there and there was assistant for you. And, yeah. uh, and you know, like there it was just so easy and you're like wh how did you create this relationship with mark that you you know, it's, you know each other so well i think it's i think we just decided it was easy to work with each other like we really enjoy working with each other we have fun um we have a similar aesthetic and you you sort of think why not spend the day with someone you like rather than spend the day with someone you don't really like that much when you're doing something creative. Yeah. So Mark and me will bounce off each other. I will always say to him, I'm thinking of this, or he will show me something that will inspire me. And it's just constantly been, I imagine if we did something like that, and it's a building experience. Yeah. And I found, even though there's a lot of other people out there you could work with, you've already built the building blocks with someone and become, and gone so far. You enjoy their company, mm. they're amazing at what they do, and you don't have to talk half the time. They, they just... It's, I found that, yep. It, it's that 
visual language, which is brilliant. Uh, but the uh, you know, like obviously, you've both got the right sort of temperament because, as I said, there was n n not one. Oh, there has been fights. <laughs> There's been there? fights. We haven't really done it on set, but we yeah, but. He's one of these those people you can fight with, and the moment it's said, it's pretty much gone. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you need to in a creative world because yeah. you've got to get your point across, or you know, like, or disagree, or you know, like, or have another um, a better way of doing it, or something. And then that person doesn't like the idea of no, I want to do it my way. <laughs> but but also, I think with Mark and me, he's got a similar. Um, th the visual comes first. He will, you know, even knock down paid work to do work we're doing if it doesn't if it's clashing with something because he's he just thinks it's that important and so it's about having a great day and producing good stuff right? or, or producing stuff that you're enjoying to do you know like it's yeah we're, we're quite lucky on that level so here you are and we've come out of um of the lockdown well we hope we we have uh are you thinking about the, your next move or have you already got it in yep. your head? I've got, we've got two. You've we've, got two? Yeah. Not one, two. No, we've got two, if not three actually, yeah. And are you starting to, you know, like move towards it? Yeah. You know, like, I, I know that um, Mark hasn't been well, but, you know, like that's not stopping him. No. I'm sure he's a very creative man and wants yep. to keep on working. Yeah. Uh, are you, you know, like, when do you think, will it be this year? Or? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it will be. It, it, yeah, we've already started on, on two um, different things we're doing and um, we've made some headway. Obviously, lockdown affected it of last year. Of course yeah. But these ones in particular are based more, even more so on people from the past, like real characters, and some of these we're going to have characters that used to be in St Kilda in some of the, these... Oh, okay. that we're going to make, yeah. And um, there, and one has been another one we're doing has been supported by the city of Melbourne actually, which is um, uh, about a cafe, a famous cafe that was in the city of Melbourne. So, still there? No, it's not still oh, there. Oh, because I was going to try and guess. <laughs> no, it's not still there. But it's um, yeah, we've I've in lockdown I did a lot of um, research, and it's. It's that thing that fact is just fascinating. Yeah. And and I, I think sometimes we don't pay enough homage or ode to what has gone on in the past. Yep. And if you glamorise it, it's so exciting. Yep. Um, which is a lot of, of the images we we, we will um, base them on fact. But and maybe these ones won't be as as glamorised. But um, it's so exciting to um, talk to people that live through a different period. And you know where we've come, and and what they, how they saw it at that time, yep. and um, so these cafes we've spoken to, this particular famous cafe we're going to do the city of Melbourne one on. I reached out to a lot of other businesses in the city of Melbourne and said we're going to do this thing based on this cafe, and they were really excited to um, uh, partake in it. And so, like getting back to not being part of the thing in the art world already, I'm already. Because I like artworks that aren't necessarily in galleries. Okay. You know, so okay. even though it's great to be part of, like yep. this exhibition, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if this was um, shown in all the theatres and cafes in the city of Melbourne where this initially started, like how we did the Victorian. So make a film of this one. We'll do, a, we'll do a film of this one and, yep. do, and do stills of this one as well. Right. And another one based on some famous characters from St Kilda. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's plenty... There's plenty to do. Gerard O'Connor, you amaze me. Um, you excite me. Oh, I, I get excited when I see your images and I talk to you and and you're like and as I said, you've got a very calming and and and, and you know, you don't big note yourself, do you? You know, no. like you, you haven't got that sort of um, manner. Well, there's I kind of don't see the point. You're so busy. There's so much to do. What excites me is visuals. Creativity really excites me. I love meeting people that, yep. look, I love your passion for what you're doing. I love you, like you, the fact that you're doing shows and talking to artists and been on the radio for a long time, came from Mushroom Records. It's fantastic. That's, that's a passion that creates shows like what's happening now. And I think probably, weirdly, in, we're similar in, in ways. You don't big note yourself either. And, and you don't because you're enjoying what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And quite often people are big noting because they're, 
maybe insecure. Like, who's got time for that? You, yep. you, you're better off to just be doing more work yep. or coming up with another idea. Well, thank you. And because my my mission is, as the art hunter, is to support the arts. Yeah, which uh, is, that's, that's what I'm here for. Which is absolutely um, brilliant. Yeah. So thank you, Gerard no O'Connor. Worries. Thanks for having me. And what's your partner's name again? Mark yeah. Wozniak. Um, who is a brilliant um, a person as well. A brilliant stylist. And, and next time maybe we'll get Mark on. He wasn't Ab- available absolutely. today. I might get him on separately and then we can talk about you. Yes. And then he can tell me how much of a bitch you are. <laughs> I should have been more bitchy about him, actually. No, <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. So thank you. No worries. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm David Hunt and you've been watching The Art Hunter.